Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to be back. I want to say a thank you to Jonathan Clark for uh, speaking a few words earlier. Uh, just to give you a little bit more, uh, you know, the ministry that happens at Murray State is, is amazing. The uh, past couple weeks we've had uh, a, a lady from Taiwan who we met at Murray, uh, at the BCM in Murray, um, who was... Uh, who was converted? She she heard the, 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 the gospel and was saved because of the ministry of the BCM. So and that just happened. You know, she, was, she was in her in her home uh, you know, just just a few weeks back. Uh, you know, I even think about my own uh, personal journey. I know that, that, that Jonathan he, he preached uh, spending time with the Lord daily in prayer and in the Word, and so uh, he, he convinced me. And once I started uh, really. Uh, to experience and to take in and learn about who the Lord was through spending that kind of intentional time changed my life, and out of that came the call to ministry. I've even seen a change in my own family's life because they've done the same thing, and so I kind of traced that back through Jonathan and the ministry that happens at the BCM. So I want to thank him for that, um, and, and to continue to or to ask you to continue to, to give to the cooperative program and, uh, and ministries. Like that, I know that with 2020 and COVID, there was a lot of different things going on. Different things have to try to, to settle. The uh, the campus was different, and everything was 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 different. Um, but uh, it's to be great to hear that the fruit the Lord's bringing to the ministries there. So you know, 2020 was an odd year for a lot of us, uh, not just the folks at the BCM. Um, you know, 2020 was a was a year that you could. Uh, that you could do a, you could figure out how human beings work. It, it provided an opportunity to kind of study human beings in a little bit different way. And one of those areas, one of those areas, was in the areas of sports. There were some studies done on the effect that having no crowds at games, and how that affected the performance on the field. And you know, I'm sure it was odd too. You, you know. Come home on a Saturday or Sunday, and you turn on the TV and you watch a football game. There's no crowds. I mean, it was it was odd. You had the NFL, college football, piping in crowd noise just to just so it wouldn't just be silent. Uh, you know, the, the NBA put like these digital cardboard cutouts uh, throughout the whole arena. It, it just was odd. It's like they were playing in a video game. Just have some kind of semblance of a crowd there. Now, as hard as people tried, there wasn't there wasn't much to uh, to be able to, um, to to simulate the 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 crowd being there because I mean the, the players they still felt the emptiness in the stadium. There's one one uh, baseball player that was talking about the, the crowd that says that you know the crowd just keeps your adrenaline going, it keeps it keeps your uh, attention. And that's just making it really hard to get locked in, especially late in the game when you're tired and starting to get pretty hot. Everything's just, just kind of seeming to drag on just a little bit. You know, I didn't play in the major leagues. I never, never played. Uh, I, I, I uh, didn't make the uh, draft on that one. Um, but, you know, it seems to me that one of the hardest things about uh, not being in front of a, of a, a crowd, you know, feel like you're given everything that you possibly have. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're trying, and you know that there's cameras on the other end, that, that there's, there's people out there watching you on TV, but it's just hard when you can't see any of them. You feel like you're given all of your energy to go into this performance. You're, you're, you're giving your, your heart and soul to this game, but you feel like it's just in front of no one. Like, it's just for, for fun, even though that there is people <coughs> watching on the TV. You know, I don't think that the writer of Hebrews had Major League Baseball in mind when he wrote Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He didn't have Major League Baseball during a worldwide pandemic in mind. But he did have you, and he had me, and he had his congregation in mind when he wrote to them. Um, and he, he was talking about the Christian walk. I've even heard it called, that's not so much a walk as it is a Christian run. 
as we live faithful lives to, to Jesus. He compared living as a Christian to someone running a race. Now, I also want to make, make sure that, that we're, we're, we are clear here. He's not talking about just living your lives in general, right? You start off as a baby, you, you know, grow up, and you, you get married, and you have children, and you work a job, and you send them on, you send the, 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 the kids on, you re, re, retire, you go play golf, you end up, you know, hopefully living a long, happy, peaceful life, and that's your race. No, 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 what he's talking about is a race of faith. That means that we're, that we're living our lives, but we're doing so clinging to Jesus. That is the, is the race. It's the race of faithfulness that we're talking about here. Not just living, but living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is the race that we're talking about here. And, and as we'll read here in just one second, you'll see that, that he envisions this runner not running a race in a hollow stadium. Not in, a, not in a pandemic type of stadium. He envisions us running our race, living our faithful lives in a track that's in a, it's in a stadium filled with spectators. And it's a resounding crowd of witnesses who are looking and cheering us on. And he, he has us as, as runners living our lives, running with the best in the game. Towards the finish line, where there is a grand prize at the end for all who finish, that is worth every drop of sweat, blood, or tear along the way. And so his message, and it's God's message for us this morning, is that in the view of all of those who have lived faithful lives, all of those in the past, in view of them, Follow Jesus, who lived a perfect life, and finish the race. Persevere. Finish the race. If you have your Bibles, open up to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you haven't already, I have it on the, the, the screen here. And let me read it. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore... Since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray and ask the, the Lord to show us what he means by these words. Father God, I come to you now knowing that if you are not here with us, if you are, if you are, are not here with me as I, as I preach from this word, if you're not there with everyone who is listening, then we might as well pack up and go home. But God, we need you, and we need you to, to, uh, to be here, to be present, to take these words and press them on our hearts. If you're not here, they're just words, but when you are here, they're great. It's great power and power to salvation. Lord, we pray for this word to jump into our lives, for this message of perseverance to sink deep, and Lord, change us. Give us a vision for what lays on the other side of this life that's worth running full steam ahead to. Do this now, for we need it. We must have you here. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So the author has us in our race of faith. You stand, think, think about, you have a race, you're starting, and you're getting to your starting blocks. You look around, and it's a full crowd. It's packed, people everywhere, and they're all there to see you run. Now, who are these spectators, right? We, we, we read here um, that, um, that, we, that we're, we're, 
we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, a large cloud of witnesses that are, are, are here. So who are these spectators? And if you take your, your Bible and just probably flip over one page, Hebrews chapter 11, if you just, just glance your eyes through, you'll see some names that, that will pop out at, at you. You've got guys like Abraham and Moses and David. You've got all of those Old Testament saints. You've got uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Moses, David, women such as Rahab and Sarah. And who are all of these people? Well, they are people that God made a promise. They believed God's promise. And because they believed God's promise, they oriented their lives around it. They oriented their lives around those promises. Now, that's a lot of words to describe what faith is. What is faith? Faith is really, if you want to, if, if you want to, to focus in on, on, on what, what faith is, focus on the promise. Faith is a response to a promise. There is no faith outside of a promise. Someone makes a promise, you believe it, and you act as if it's true. That is what faith is. It's got to be anchored in to a promise. And so that's what all these Old Testament saints, Old Testament people of God were commended for. Right? So you got guys like, uh, so God promised Abraham to uh, make him into a great nation. One that included, you know, uh, Gentiles. I mean, he made him into a great nation that, that, a, that salvation would come through his line. And so Abraham believed God. And so he left his, his people and he went where God told him to. He was even willing to sacrifice his own son if that's what it took to believe in God's promises. God promised Noah he was going to destroy the entire earth. But that there was one way that he could be saved. And if you build this big boat, everyone's going to think you're nuts. But if you build it, and you bring all the animals into it, and you bring all your family into it, you will be saved. That's what the promise was. Noah believed, and he built the boat, and he put the animals on, and he was saved. It was his response to God's promise. You have Rahab who heard about God's promises to, to destroy her own people because of their wickedness to, of, of Jericho. God was going to destroy it. She, through the grapevine, she was a Gentile, she heard this promise. She'd seen what God had done. She believed this promise. And so she actually betrayed her own country to help Israel. And she was saved. There are many more that are not mentioned by name. But they are ones who heard God's promises, believed them, and the evidence of believing in those promises were that they oriented their lives around them at all costs, even until their deaths. Now, you've got uh, the last few verses of Hebrews 11 pays a tribute to those who did pay the ultimate sacrifice. They were the ones who obeyed, who, who believed God's promises to the very end, even when the end was horrific. It pays tribute to those who faced jeers and flogging, were imprisoned, were stoned, sawed in two, killed by the sword, wore sheepskin and goatskin as clothes because of their poverty. They're persecuted and mistreated. They wandered in deserts and mountains. They lived in caves and holes in the ground. All because they heard God's promises, believed them, and oriented their lives around them at all costs. So these men and women, the ones we see called out by name in Scripture, and those since, those who believe God's promises, those are the ones who fill the stadium. Those are the ones who finished their lives. They have died on, on earth, but they serve as witnesses to us. Why, why does God want us to look at those, those as, as uh, Pastor Matt calls those old dead guys? Why does, he, why does God want us to look at them? 
He wants us to do that because he wants us to see that living faithful lives to Jesus is possible. It is possible. It's not an unrealistic expectation that, oh, I just can't meet that. I'll just have to, to, to settle. No, you can live a life that is devoted to Jesus Christ to the very end. Even if the end, everything makes you want to just forget it all. You can do it. Now, it's not under your own strength. God preserves those to the very end. So, uh, he, he, he wants us to, to, to look, to be encouraged that you can do it. If you walk with Jesus, if you keep your eyes fixed on him, as we will see in just one second, you will be numbered among those very same faithful people. You're not alone in living this life right where you are and, and, and all of the unique trials of this, of this time. You're not, it's not a unique experience. You're not going through a unique hardship that others in the past haven't gone through. They remain faithful. You can too. Now, I'm not sure where you're at with your walk with the Lord this morning. have to think that some of you are out of breath from, from, this, from this run, that you're panting from trying to, to live right now. Nothing seems easy. Every time you think you've got a handle on sin, it gives you an uppercut to the mouth. Every time a burden is lifted, you think you'll experience some relief. Another burden comes down heavy on you. Every time you feel it spiritually rich time with Jesus and you think, oh, this is going to last. It takes mere days and you feel like you're back in the desert. And if it hasn't crossed your, your mind, it might. When you wonder if, if just the shifting sand, if I get to the end of my life, where am I going to be? <coughs> if I'm experiencing turmoil and got turbulence now, at the end, well, how am I going to be, am I, is my heart going to be cold? Is my heart going to be cold towards Jesus? That, that worries me. Is my heart going to be cold? Toward, am I going to be found just distracted in, a, in the left field? Or am I going to be found with my eyes fixed on Jesus? I, uh, you, you see people who claim to be Christians, they Man, they've got singers and preachers. And they're turning their back on the faith. They're dropping like flies, it seems, sometimes. And I think, am I, am I going to be one of those? I was, where I was on an airplane this past week. Sat next to a lady named Barbara. Struck up a wonderful conversation. And she told me that I asked her how long she's been a follower of Jesus. She said she's been following Jesus since she was five. She was probably in her 70s, probably. And I asked to tell her, you know, just a little bit about her, her testimony. Her and her husband were faithful servers of the, the, the church. He, he, uh, he was a brilliant musician. She said, oh, honey, I can still hear him play. I loved hearing him play. He was so good. Him and I would do ministry for 20 years. Nine years. But he um, went on a trip, traveling around, was singing, and ran off with another girl. And, um, he left me and my four boys and left the faith of Jesus. That hit me. Because the very thing I've been thinking about this past week. Who's to say that I won't end up like that too. But this word, looking at others who have done it, gives such an encouragement that if I keep my eyes on Jesus, I'm going to be there at the end. You will too. If you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you will be counted among God's people in the end. But that's the qualifier though. You keep your eyes on Jesus, and that means watching how you live right now. 
How do you be sure that you're there at the end? You run a good race right now. Powerful, powerful word. You know, a faithful life is not just a goal to aspire to or a hope. If all things go right or skeptical, well, I, I guess we'll, we'll see where things end up. No, a strong finish is a guarantee for those who run with their eyes fixed on Jesus. And they'll be found among God's people in the end. So God tells us to take our eyes and look up and to see all of those faithful people, whether it's people in the Bible, whether it's your grandmother who's been a faithful follower for a long time. We're, we, we look to them as, as, as witnesses. That God saves his people to the very end. We, 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 we see that, but he also tells us to take our eyes and we fix them on Jesus. It says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Have you ever tried to like make a copy? And then you make a copy of a copy and you just keep copying the different copies? What happens at the very end? Things are sideways, you got lines going in it, it's, you know, coloration's off, right? So, in our faith, yeah, we look to others as, as, as a witness to us, but we don't model our faith after them. Because if we do, our faith's going to have holes in it just like theirs was. We must model our faith, pattern our faith, pattern our way of living to the original. And that's Jesus Christ, and that's why we keep our eyes on How do we run our race? We keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's why we're called followers of Jesus, right? He is out in front, and we're following behind him. We're followers of Jesus. Take that for, for what it, it, it's worth. We are following behind Jesus. Where he goes, we go. What he does, we do. What he thinks, we think. What he loves, we love. What he pursues, we do. We're followers of Jesus, right in line with him. It's like the Daytona 500. We are right behind him. You get out a little bit, and there's trouble. Stay tucked in behind Jesus. Now, who is this Jesus? I'm, I'm excited about this. Who is this Jesus? It says he's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So when you break down these two words, I'll spend a little, little bit of time here. When you, when you break down these two words, pioneer and perfecter, in the original language, the root of the word for pioneer is the same word for beginning. The root of the word for perfecter is the same word for finish. Same word for ending, telos. It's the same, same root. So when we place our faith in Jesus... Because Jesus is the one we are following behind. He is our beginning and our ending. He is the one that, that starts and ends our faith. He begins and ends. He initiates and completes. He starts and finishes. He pioneers and perfects our faith. We place our faith in Jesus because his promises have already started to, to come true in him. And at the end of our faith, we get Jesus, all of who he is, and the saving benefits that he achieved on the cross. So let's look at pioneer. We look to him as the pioneer of our faith. Think of like a founder, okay? Kind of using maybe some of the of a, of a word we might use. He's the pioneer of our faith. Because without Jesus, you do not get out of the starting line. If it were not for a literal man named Jesus and his work, his death, and his resurrection, which accomplished salvation, what would we have to put our faith in? Now, in our day, have you noticed how the word faith is not a buzzword? We even have non-Christians using the word faith. I remember when COVID was just starting, I pulled this news article from WDRB. It says, Downtown Louisville, eight minutes from my house. I'm going to read you a quote from it. It says, several spiritual leaders 
gathered in the midst of Jefferson Square in downtown Louisville Friday to offer prayers in the wake of the COVID-19 coronavirus spread. We are all, quote, we are all here to be spiritual leaders, to ground us in our faith traditions but also to invite Louisville to be Louisville and to remember those who are vulnerable, to remember those who do not have access the way others do, and for us to make moral decisions as we go forward as a community, says Judd Hendricks of the Interfaith Past Peace. says this, the, that the service included statements from, a, from representatives of a number of different religious faiths, including Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, and a member of the Baha'i when our culture uses the word faith, I think what they mean is whatever flavor of religious practice that you identify with. And in one sense, they are, they are right. You know, if faith is about believing promises, why do we have all these different faiths? Well, because they all have different promises. They all have different promises of what are like or what is going to happen at the end and all the different ways to get there. So in that sense, they are right. If you do this, you'll get that. But here's what lies lurking under the surface of where, uh, from where we are now. And this is, I mean, I, people that I run into, this is, is, is what they say. But our world implies that all beliefs, all these promises, that you can believe whatever promise that you want to, you know, whatever faith that you want to, because all of them have an equal claim and truth, we can't really know anything about God, truly. Your guess is as good as mine. So because of that, you can't say yours is right. You can't say that, that, that yours is wrong because we don't really know. So all faiths then are the same because who really knows if any of them are true? You believe in this. You believe in, 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 in that. There's no way to actually know. All faiths have an equal claim to truth since the real truth about God cannot be known. And so your, your, your guess is as good as mine is. And, 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 and they will say that uh, all religions are essentially the same thing. They have, you know, same same. Practices, but basically, you know, they're about the same. Well, if you go anywhere in the world and talk to a, a, a people of these various re religions, what you'll find is that most of them vehemently deny that all religions are essentially the same. They are not. They are not the same thing. And we should join that conversation as Christians by admitting that. Not all faiths are the same. Not all religions are the same. It's intellectually dishonest to say that they are. They're different promises built on different foundations, and that's okay to say. So the question is not, well, where are all religions the exact same, or where do they find commonalities, and where there's commonalities, that must be true. That's not our question. Our question also is, well, how are these religions different? That's not necessarily what the, the question is. The question is, which set of promises have a greater stake in truth? In other words, which set of promises, which faith has the most evidence that what they say will come true will come true? And as Christians, contrary to what people may say, Christians corner the market in the stake of truth. Why? Because a lot of the promises have already come true in Jesus Christ. That's why. Jesus is the founder and, and he's, he's the, the pioneer of our faith. And because of that, the promises of, of old to those Old Testament figures, the ones that we just, that we just uh, mentioned earlier, the promises made to them came true in Jesus. So, the promises that Jesus makes, when we have a claim to truth, because they've already come true in Jesus, some of them. The Old Testament figures were commended for their faith. They were given a promise of this son who would redeem them. 
God told them this. <coughs> and yeah, they saw miracles with their own eyes. And, you know, God's, the, 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 the stories of what God had done had passed down through generations. But ultimately, they staked their lives on the promise of a son to come. And, they, and, and because of that, they oriented their lives around the law, around the, the, the Jewish law. And according to God's plan, they clung on to the promise of the, the Son and did that very thing. But the Old Testament figures, they died having never seen the promise of Jesus come true. That is, until it did, until the promise ripened into reality. When a man named Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born of a woman, he claimed that he was the promised Son of God. He preached good news to the 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 poor, did miracles. He said he was going to die, and he died in a way, first of all, that he said, but second of all, that it had been prophesied for thousands of years when he was crucified on the cross in the stead of sinners. And God raised him from the dead to affirm his divinity and further claim a victory over sin and the grave. God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. He is the founder of our faith in that regard. So now when Jesus made promises of the new covenant that anyone who believes that he is the Christ and died in their stead and they live their lives according to this truth, they live their lives according to the, the, the truth that Jesus is both the Lord and Savior, then that, that, that they will be saved from eternal damnation when he promises he will also come back to the world and judge it for its sin and claim those from the dead who have believed in him. And we can say with confidence that Jesus is pioneer of faith, built with a stake in the ground of truth, because some of the promises have already become a reality in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' promises of life are better than Muhammad's promises of life because Jesus isn't dead. Jesus' promises of life are better than, uh, than, than Buddha's promises of peace because God has raised the son from the grave validating Jesus' claim that the payment for sin has been made in full and the hostility between man and God is demolished. That is true peace. Jesus' promise of love is better than the culture's promise of love because the Father already showed us how much He loves us by sending His own Son to die for you and I so we don't have to bear the wrath of God's, uh, or to bear God's wrath on sin. Jesus, historically, I mean, there's historical evidence. Jesus lived and died. He's, he, he is who the scriptures said that he was. He did what the scriptures say that he did. The fact that a man, a literal, we're not talking about fables, nothing made up. Twelve dudes witnessed a guy who was born of a woman who died on the, 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 the cross and he didn't stay there. He resurrected on the third day. That actually happened. Right. And because of that fact, and just as I am in the flesh, so Jesus was also. He died and then he rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the, of the Father. He is the founder of our faith because it actually happened and he never died. And he's right now reigning at the right hand of God. He's the pioneer. He, he, he already did it. He already lived. He's the pioneer. And so that means we can run our race of faith dedicated to the finish because Christ came. Because Christ came validating that God, that the God of the Bible sticks to his promises. And God has promised a great thing for those who persevere in faith. All right, so now let's move on to the next word. The perfecter. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. That is to say that our faith is completed or made whole. It's finished by Jesus. By design, if you were to look at what the Bible says about those men and women that are in the, the, the stadium and the hall of faith, you would find plenty of times where they did not act in faithfulness. Yeah, they got their name 
in the book and the name and the hall of faith uh, the hall of faith for uh, for their their faithfulness. They were champions of faithfulness, but there were times when they had their moments where they fell flat on their face too. By design, we see that. But because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice in every way acceptable to God on our behalf, we can be 100% confident that where our faith has holes, it is made whole in Jesus. Two different spellings there. Where our faith has holes, it is made whole by Jesus in whom we trust. Who endured incredible suffering and yet he was shown to have full faith without fail. So Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says it was entirely appropriate that God for whom and through uh, it was entire it was entirely appropriate that that, that that God for whom and through whom all things exist should and here's here's these same words should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. I want you to see this about our Lord. That he promises that your faith, as tattered as it may be, is made perfect because he gives us his perfection. Where your race of faith, where you, you trip and you stumble, Jesus makes it whole. Your race, in the Lord's eye, is perfect because of what he has done. Because of his race. Because his race is perfect, your race is perfect. He gives you that perfection. Jesus' suffering on the, the cross authenticated his work as effective and thorough to restore us completely. And he completes our faith where our faith is found lacking because his faith was tested with the hottest of Proven to be indestructible. He shares his perfection with us. Brothers and sisters, can I get a smile? Where we trip and stumble and we mess up, God makes, through Jesus, he makes it whole. That's worth celebrating. When we run our race of faith, we don't look over our shoulder wondering if we've messed up our lives beyond repair. We don't look down scared and anxious that we're going to somehow mess up God's plan for our lives. We don't look at others who are running this race along with us and say, well, my race doesn't look like their race. Where do we put our eyes? Well, we look up, but then we look ahead, and we fix our eyes on Jesus, knowing that we run, and we run full steam ahead, imperfections and all, full well knowing that his grace and his perfection covers every fracture in our faith and we finish. Amen. That's how the race is won. That's free. We're given an instruction on what to do with our eyes, but we're also given an instruction on what to do with our feet. God, through the writer of Hebrews, tells us to lay uh, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. I remember growing up, um, my room was maybe a little bit more clean than Lane's room was. <laughs> no, man. Uh, if we would we would go to bed, our rooms would be messy. You know, Lane somehow she spent the, the, the day cleaning her room, but yet it would be. Dirtier when she got done with it, when she got in and started playing with toys and different things. But it'd be time to go to, to bed and the room would be a mess, and mom would say, Make a path to your bed. Just clear paths, just move things the way you need to get up in the middle of the night. You won't, you won't trip, you won't stumble. And that's, that's what we're told here, too. The hindrances and the sin that snares us. What kind of things hinder you from your race of faith? What kind of things? It might be good things on their own. What, what, what kind of things keep you distracted from seeing, cherishing, and trusting in God's <coughs> promises? 
Throw those hindrances off and make a path for your feet. Can't afford to trip and stumble. This past week, I had a spare computer. I walked 30 yards and threw it in the dumpster. It was the most free thing I've done in a long time. I didn't want the hindrance. May we all do that same thing. Find what hinders you. What are the temptations? What is there that will obstruct your view of Christ and his promises? And throw it out. Jesus said, spoon your eye out if it causes you to, to stumble. It's a vivid picture, but it's, 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 a, it's a command. What temptations are there? So we've got, we got hindrances, temptations. What about the sin that so easily ensnares us? Now this one's going to get up close and personal. Steve was asking if he needed to wear his, his steel-toed shoes. He might have brought, brought it for, for this one. What kind of sins reside in your heart that maybe you're little, and you just haven't acted on them yet, but you know that they're there. Those sins that you keep around as uh, cute little houseplants will much sooner than you realize wrap around your ankles, through your ankles, they'll throw vines and they will they will drag you down to the fiery pit. That's the kind of sin that entangles us. That's the kind of sin to keep us turning our back twenty nine years on faith and marriage. Those sins that seem Oh, I'll deal with them someday. You leave them around to, to linger. They're like monsters. They will alter your ability to cherish and hold fast to God's promises. They will. They will heed the warning. They'll make you cause. They will cause you to doubt God's promises, or they'll they'll uh, they'll cause you to love the promises of something that can't deliver, or sometimes worse, they will lull you into indifference. About God's promises. Brothers and sisters, you who are following Christ, clear the path of temptations and sins. The big ones and the, and the, the little ones are like snakes. The little ones are just as bad, if not worse than the big ones. Clear them and finish the race. But sinners, with Jesus as the perfecter of our faith, when you take a hard fall over sin, look up at Jesus and find mercy. He will bandage your wounds with righteousness. He'll grab you by the hand, stand you up on level ground, and he'll say, follow me and let's finish this race. And that sings and that stings. 1992, Barcelona, Spain. Crowd had gathered to watch the men's 400-meter semifinal race in the 1992 Olympic Games. Among those slated to run was Derek Redmond from Britain. He was in the fourth starting lane, and so 400 meters is one lap around the track. And the gun fired, and all eight runners took off. And they rounded the first turn, and they were headed down the back stretch, and ran a red, and he turned those jets on. And he was steaming into the last turn, and went into it, but he very quickly pulled back and hobbled to the side. So the cameras realize it, and they focus it. On Redmond, they get a close up and they see that he's pulling his right hamstring. Probably pulled something. You see two people that come to his aid, one man and one woman, and the, the man has a walkie-talkie, and it's kind of, kind of funny, he's got you know the the, 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 the runner there, and he's like barking orders into his walkie-talkie. And that other lady's got a can of spray. I don't know what she's gonna do with the can of spray. But she had it, she was trying to spray some stuff and Redmond's just sitting there like, okay, get out. And he, he, he jumps up, and he begins to gallop. He begins to gallop along this path. He, he starts off kind of quick, but slowly he slows down. And the cameras have finished everyone else. Everyone else has finished the, the, the race. They've already gone through, and now they, the, the crowd has completely got their attention. On Redmond. Now this time he was man, he was barely putting weight on, on one one foot. And, and the crowds were cheering him on. And 
camera's focusing in on him. This time he's really grimacing in pain. You can see the pain with every step. And uh, he gets around to this turn and the camera angle changes and kind of gets him coming down the front stretch there. And if you, if you watch the video, it's pretty, pretty painful to watch. He's screaming in pain. And out of nowhere, you see in the, from the right hand or the right side of the screen, the man comes running after him. And he puts his arm around his son. And the son slows his pace, and they both get to a spot, and they just stop. And the son buries his head into his father's shoulder, screaming in agony. But they both keep moving towards the finish line. Different man with a walkie-talkie comes up. Father shoes him away. And his father's got this. Two of them are near the finish line with the baby steps. And the announcer says, Applause is swelling throughout Olympic Stadium as Redmond, with assistance this time, approaches the finish line he so desperately wanted to reach. And the two Cross the finish line with no dry eye in presence. Redmond had finished the race. Brothers and sisters, his dad is like Jesus. He picks us up and dusts us off and links arms, arms with us and says, Follow me to the finish and let's finish this race out. Jesus at our side, we bury our head and his shoulder and he helps us to complete this race. Without his grace and his love being there, we'd never finish on our own. I wonder what, what made Redmond want to finish. Of course, he was going to get last. What made him, what made him finish? He was what, been over there to the side, hobbled off, and just sat there. What, I mean, people would have understood. He, he's hurt. What is, what is the reason? Why did, why did Redmond finish? I think it's the same reason that Jesus endured the, the, the cross. Same reason. Read with me in verse 2. It says that, why did Jesus, well, what was Jesus striving for? It said he was striving towards the joy that was set before him. Jesus finished the, the race. He had been promised great things. He promised that upon his death and resurrection and the ascension, he would be united with his Father and he would be given the inheritance of all things. Pluto's his. Earth is his. You are his. Everything is his. He would be the inheritor of everything. Things seen, things unseen. Promise was made to Jesus if he died on the cross instead of sinners. In a brutal murder. This was the promise made to Jesus. He trusted God, trusted the Father, and oriented his life around the promises coming true. And so, being stripped of all of his clothes and beaten with a whip and had shards of bones in it, he was pierced in the side with a spear, hanging on two pieces of wood for the entire world to gawk at. The world would have understood he had he just hopped off to the side and just said, forget it. I think the world would have understood but Jesus believed the promise of the Father and he's willing to stake his life on it. Finished the race. And in the process, he made a complete mockery of the shame of crucifixion. And because of his glorious finish, Jesus ascended the winner's podium and now sits the best seat in the house. And that's at the right hand of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, what's, why do we finish our race? Man, the race in the moment ain't fun. Sometimes. It isn't fun. It's hard. It's hard work. Why do we do it? Same reason that Jesus did. While the seat at the right hand of the Father is reserved only for one, the one who sits on it promises that he will share his awards with those who finish their race on earth with faithfulness. He promises to share his inheritance with all of those who are God's sons and daughters by faith. 
That is the joy that we strive towards. That joy awaits us on the other side. We keep our eyes on Jesus, but where are we going? We're going there. That awaits us. Paul, when he was at the end of his life, he knew his death would be coming soon. In 2 Timothy 4, he, he even encourages his own soul with this truth. He says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. And there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the, the, the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Not only to me, but those who have loved his appearing. Jesus has won all the medals and the accolades, but he shares them with us who finished this life in faith and have been found following him. Brothers and sisters, I want you to look around at those in this room. Move your head, crane your head. Okay. <laughs> these, these people who you are with are running this race alongside you. This is a, this is a pack. This is a crossroads fellowship pack that is headed somewhere behind Jesus, but they're headed somewhere. You're surrounded by those who are running along with you in this race of faith. And standing on the other side, beyond the finish line, stand the judge, an official, Jesus Christ, who having already run the race and the medals, shares them with those like you and me who loved his appearing. You're in this race together. Remind each other to keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you, when you see things in the path of those who are you're running alongside, help them. Help them to clear their path of hindrances, to clear their path of sin, because you've got to be there at the end. All of you. The same joy that keeps Jesus running into his death is the same joy that we, that we run to also. Because Jesus shares his rich, eternal rewards with us. Glorious riches of forgiveness of sins. You're joining with people who worship your Lord God. No, there's no sin. There's no blemish. No spot. You get to see God in his full power and his mighty strength with your own eyeballs. In a place where pain is a thing of the past. There is a place on the other side of the finish line where there's righteousness and true peace. And there's freedom from sin, and there's safety, and there's closeness with God, and it's all permanent. That is the joy that is set before you. Run, run to it, run to Christ, where this joy can be found. I'm gonna call Robin Stevens uh, up to the front, and she will she will come up here and play a, a, a little bit. We're gonna end it just a little bit different. Brother, sister, I, I beg you, I, I beg you, don't quit your faith in Jesus. For it's only a little while and you will see him face to face. Make your path straight, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and finish the, the race. Now, you know, we just... We just heard the, the, the inheritance that awaits us. We just heard the, the, what awaits us on the other side. And it's worth every tear, blood, drop. It's worth all of it. Forgiveness of sin, closeness with God, that awaits us. We, we get that in part now, and we get crumbs now, but the feast is coming. And so I, I wanted Robin to, to play. Uh, we're going to pass the offering baskets. Listen, you got an inheritance coming to you. Use this opportunity to, to give what you have. Give what you have in thankfulness. We're thankful for a God who gives us what's coming, who promises great things. How do we, how do we orient our lives around it? Hey, we, we give now. We give what He's given us. We worship Him through our tithes and offerings. Baskets are being passed. Um, search your heart. Take the time of finding what's near. Go to the Lord and commit your grace.